Thank you, Jessica, for that introduction and good evening, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be here this evening um, to speak on a topic that I suppose I have been involved with and been doing lots of research in over the last number of years. I'm going to start with a quote from a very, very wise woman um, when we were discussing about understanding the needs of autistic people. And it was that it was, if you meet one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. And this evening I'm here to talk about my experiences as a professional in working with the autistic community. Unlike the other speakers, I don't have a lived experience of autism, but what I do have is an opportunity to try and understand about the experiences that autistic girls and women have and try and incorporate that into my work as a professional occupational therapist. Without these experiences or the, the experience to engage with this with the women, I truly would not be able to support them um, in providing the, the service or occupational therapy engagement that I provide. We can have all the um, background and degrees in the entire world, but truly it is about understanding the needs of the person that we are working with and seeing them as a unique individual to try and support them. In particular, this evening, as we talk about engaging in the world of work and the world of employment. Furthermore, I've had the opportunity to be involved with um, not only supporting people through um, occupational therapy, but also in developing um, internship programs for um, autistic people and supporting autistic individuals in the transition from um, college uh, into employment. So I'm starting kind of this evening with this image of um, what it's supposed to represent as potentially journeys in navigating the world of work. So what I want you to think about is to think about your journey. You know, maybe you're a professional on this webinar this evening um, and maybe you are a mother or maybe you are an autistic woman. And we all experience our journey into employment very, very differently. There are various twists and turns and U-turns along the road and ultimately our journey isn't one linear direct pathway where we know exactly where we want to go. And if you're a professional, I want you to really consider that as you work with autistic women and girls in supporting them enter into the workplace or supporting in neurodiverse individuals in engaging in employment because there is no one set rule for all and each individual will have their own unique experiences. Likewise, this image is to represent the broad spectrum of autism. And when we talk this evening, we're talking about autism and neurodiversity and every individual is unique. You know, maybe you're the person who likes swinging on that swing and getting vestibular input, or you're the person who likes to jump up and down on that trampoline. We each have our own unique needs and strengths that we bring to the workplace. And when we think about the autism spectrum, it's very broad with individuals who have specific support needs and strengths along that spectrum and we need to consider that as we talk about employment because there are various different facets of employment whether that be full-time employment, part-time employment, supported employment, you know, we really have to consider there are various different aspects to work. So really tonight I want to kind of share with you a little bit about the context of employment and work and I suppose my uh, my talk is really about focusing on kind of what do we all, what do we know what do we need to know and I think the idea of tonight's evening is very much about we're listening to the voices of autistic women in sharing their experiences of the world of work and neurodiversity within the workplace and really that is the starting block of where we truly need to go if we are to really consider how we can support individuals in engaging in employment and getting that a message of awareness out there to ensure that people can engage in what is a human right, a human right to work. 
And employment, as I said, can take on so many different facets and we can experience a work and employment in lots of different ways and can be defined in lots of different ways. It can be full time employment, of paid employment, voluntary work. It can be part time work, working within the home. Um, and so when we really consider in in, in employment what we're really looking at is is we're talking about employment begins to emerge in transitionary stages in life in particular maybe it happens during late teen years it happens during early adulthood or throughout adulthood and Elaine referred to the idea of ivory towers and societal expectation around how employment works and if we think about society we're hearing lots of, in the COVID-19 world about the leaving cert and we think about that that there's a kind of a transitionary expectation of society that we engage in secondary school go on after our leaving cert to potentially engage in college PLC courses, further education and enter employment. But we know having, you know, working with the autistic community and the neurodiverse community that that isn't always the case. It, it doesn't always have to follow this linear stage approach. There is often what people experience is periods of transition and change. And when we talk about employment is that we periods of transition happen throughout the lifespan for every individual, whether they engage in a new job, a change of career, that the person returns to education, the person takes a leave of absence and returns into employment. And each of these transitionary stages brings about a sense of crossroads, um, a sense of change. And we need to be very mindful of that as we talk about employment. Going back to this idea of this societal expectation of engaging in the education and going into employment, we need to be mindful when we think about um, young women at the age of 17, 18, trying to make decisions associated with future work and employment. I think if you think back to your 17 year old self, did you really know what you really wanted to do in life? And we put this expectation on that people have to have a sense of understanding. It's very complex of knowing what we want to actually do in you know, our 20s, our 30s, our 40s, our 50s and 60s. And as employment and our pension age begins to increase, we're going to be in the world of work for a very, very long time. We know when we look at the research is, is that employment is often said to be an um, ambition for all individuals as they enter into adulthood and engage in adulthood. And that is no different for the, for the neurodiverse community. Unfortunately, within Ireland, we really struggle to understand the numbers of people um, uh, from an employment context. And sometimes what we have to look at is, is we have to look at the broader context of employment. And Elaine referred to it in her presentation there about um, the disabled community. And when we look at the literature um, in relation to prevalence and instance and percentages around employment and unemployment, we do have to look at that literature. What we do know in Ireland is, is unfortunately, people with disabilities are less than half as likely as people without disabilities to be employed. And a recent report in 2009 showed that we really have one of the lowest employment rates for people with disabilities in the EU, which is really something that Ireland has got to get to grips with um, in terms of really beginning to, um, to limit this kind of liminal space for individuals. Ireland has one of the highest um, gaps between people with and without disabilities when it comes to employment. And this is despite massive advances, advances that we have had in legislation over the years. But what we do know is, is that we've had an increased access to programmes such as DARE in terms of employment, in terms of education, but we still really have a far way to go. When we look at autism and employment, we know that really that from all of these webinars is that there's been an increase in the number of individuals gaining um, a diagnosis of autism in the last number of years. But what we do know is, is that unfortunately less than 10% of autistic people are in an employment, mostly as it states in low paid jobs. When we look at the literature, it can tend to be a very negative picture of employment. And what we really need to try and do is 
open the, 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 our, our eyes as professionals and individuals to see that is it really this negative and do we need to really explore um, those experiences that people have. We know that employment enables an income and improves quality of life, it can promote independence and engage and participate in interests or support somebody to get impact on their health and their well-being. But when we look at the research is, is that we see that many individuals are still struggling with employment outcomes um, in the general research. Unfortunately, when we look at the research of what we do know is, is that we know that autistic women are completely underrepresented. And this is really unfortunate because the research and the discourse is truly male dominated. Um, you know, we really struggle that to see um, how women, autistic women are being represented within the literature and their experience that they're having. What we do know is, is that the research, the autistic research community are really calling for more research to be conducted with autistic people rather than about them. And that's a real need that we have currently existing. Because what we do know is, is that there is a growing body of literature that's currently reporting of the very poor literature that does exist, is, is that women are less likely to be employed compared to autistic men. And we don't know if whether gender is impacting on this specifically. Um, and is that because of general gender or is that because of specific areas of strength and challenges that the women are presenting with. What we do know is, is when we look at some of the research that has been conducted, of which really only one article has ever really differentiated between the experiences of autistic women, is, is that we see that autistic women in this study conducted by Baldwin and Cosley identify that women have a very high educational attainment. But what is currently existing is, is that the women are either being employed or they're underemployed. And what we mean by that is that their skills and their qualifications um, don't necessarily match up to the skills of the job. So their qualifications are potentially far exceeding what the skills are required of this particular job. And it's a real aspect that we really need to start considering. What we do know is, is that of the women that were unemployed um, in this, um, this study was that 56% wanted a job with a preference for part-time employment. And this is a really interesting concept that we need to start exploring is, is that employment, as we said, does not necessarily always have to be full-time. As I said, one paper has differentiated in a systematic review, differentiating women from men when they're presenting their findings. But what they did find was is that the women experienced underemployment, unemployment and difficulty in maintaining employment. We don't know again when we start looking at kind of gender and societal expectation as whether gender kind of begins to become an issue because of um, pay gaps, which generally exist between um, men and women and parental responsibilities. But what we do know is, is that basically looking at this literature, that nothing exists focusing on differentiating women from men or understanding the true experiences of autistic women within the workplace. And so with this void, we really are struggling to understand where we can actually go. What we do know is that autistic individuals and autistic women have incredible strengths, um, including high quality work, trustworthy, honest, they have a desire for employment, they're ambitious and are incredibly reliable. And what we do know is, is that employers are beginning to really understand these strengths um, and are developing initiatives in terms of supporting individuals within the workplace. But what we must be mindful of is, is that mantra that we need to remember that individuals don't always necessarily want to engage through autism initiatives in terms of employment, but want to engage in work on their own merit. One of the aspects that um, I have experienced over the years in working with women is, is this idea of disclosure and reasonable accommodation. And one of the challenges is for autistic women is, is that autistic women often get a late diagnosis and therefore they have a lack of support in managing um, this disclosure process or reasonable accommodations. So disclosure is a process by which we need to inform 
um, employers about disability. And going back to even what Elaine said earlier on is, is that that direct learning from people that all of the employers can read everything in policies and booklets, but really it's about supporting individuals to support them in their disclosure of a disability within the workplace, which seems to be a particular void at the moment in terms of how we can support people. There are so many reasonable accommodations that can be provided for individuals um, to fully do their job and engage in equal employment opportunities. And it's about just understanding what are those reasonable accommodations by teasing them out with the person in order to ensure that they have success within the workplace. We know that there are many challenges that do, that do exist, um, in particular managing the whole interview process, but in, in also looking at employment from the process from the start to the finish. And what we really need to do is to support individuals to build a sense of understanding of what their challenges are in order to support their disclosure. A recent report that was conducted by um, Simon Harris um, was about reviewing Irish healthcare services for individuals with autism. And what did come out of this was that we need to really consider how the HSE can work with adults to support them in terms of education, employment. And so therefore seeing this is an important first step in trying to see how the services can develop to support individuals engaged in employment. I suppose my phenomenon that idea is, is this iceberg phenomenon. And if you're a professional, sometimes you will begin to read the literature and see the literature and have concepts or um, myths around autism. What's really important is that we sometimes, what we see and therefore think happens at the top, but what we truly need to do is to get to know a person in order to truly understand what their experiences are and see what lies beneath to truly support them in engaging in employment. At the moment, I'm currently, um, as Jessica said, working with a number of women and um, conducting in-depth interviews to explore their experiences in navigating the world of work. This is one of the first types of research from an Irish perspective, which is truly going to allow us to by finding and bridging that gap in the research that currently exists within an Irish perspective. And hopefully this time next year, I'll be back to share with you the really interesting findings that are emerging from the study. I know my time is up, so I'd just like to leave you with some of these parting thoughts. No two people may want or require a similar suite of supports. We need to be person-centred in our approach if we are to truly understand how we can support a person to engage in employment. We also need to think about building a therapeutic rapport with individuals. Don't create ceilings for individuals. We need a strengths-based approach demystify our views of what we currently know and learn from working with individuals rather than always just reading the information and gaining that information. Individuals with autism have immense potential. However, we can often be the stumbling block as professionals in terms of supporting them in reaching their potential. So I would say what's really, really important in moving forward is, is that we consider how we truly can support individuals to reach that potential. Many thanks.